to get another notification, which has been irritating some people. I'm so sorry about that. So, uh, but I learned what causes it. I didn't know until just, just a few minutes ago. So uh, here I am doing white highlights, first layer of white, and using pretty fairly large brushes. I don't want to get too, too detailed. I don't want to get too small. Um, I want to stay loose. So, the, of course, the, the large brushes help stay loose. And, and they make interesting marks. If you followed me very long at all, you've heard me say probably several times, the essence of good painting is making interesting marks. The act of painting is essentially the act of making interesting marks. So, of course, the big, huge, a huge challenge of learning how to paint is learning which marks are interesting. That's a huge part of our journey. Um, I didn't have language for it when I was a young man, but uh, looking back, I realized I, I had a real advantage in this regard because my dad was a was a good painter. He was not it wasn't his profession, but he was a good painter, self-taught and somehow just had an, an intuition that served him well. And his marks in his paintings were quite mature. And uh, it was years before I really began to understand what it was about his paintings that were better than mine. <laughs> that is to say, way after I graduated from college with an art major, um, his paintings were still better than mine. Now, mine were more realistic. Mine were tighter. <laughs> Mine were <laughs> more controlled. Do you hear a bunch of words there? Like naughty, <laughs> bad words, right? By the way, that face looks terrible. I sure hope I am going to fix it up later on. Here's one thing to do just to make sure I don't get too tight. Um, so interesting marks. And that's why I'm using, well, I'm using a fan brush in one hand and a chip brush in the other so that my marks are interesting. I was thinking, reflecting on this yesterday and I, I, when I wasn't broadcasting. Let me try to describe so in different language um, why, at least in my opinion, why loose, there's not a perfect word for this. I call it, I call it most of the time I call it real painting. <laughs> why real painting, why uh, Impressionistic, not impressionism, but impressionistic loose painting is superior over super realistic painting. Now, again, I like, I have some really good friends who do super realistic paintings and they're very good. And some of them are quite famous and some of them are making a lot of money. Some of them. Um, and I enjoy doing realism once in a while. You can go to my website and you can find me doing Look at my automotive paintings. The first, the front half of the car is tight and the back half is all loose. But anyway, I, do, I don't do impressionism because I'm unable to do realism. That is the case, sadly, for too many people. They do, they do impressionistic painting by default because they're unable to do realism. That's unfortunate. And um, I think everybody should be developed the skills to do super realism. Okay. I digress. Let me get back on, on topic. Why is impressionistic painting superior? And I'm going to, in fact, I'll use Bob Ross again. Because when you paint loosely, things happen on the canvas that are beyond what you thought. Let me zoom in a little bit so you can guys see me. You don't have to see me. You can just watch me paint. When you paint in a loose manner, Things happen, like Bob Ross, happy accidents. Things happen on the canvas that you didn't anticipate, that you didn't plan on. And I contend that transcendent, I, that is, I hope that's not too spooky a word for some of you, or too spiritual sounding word, but I contend that transcendent things <laughs> only happen, or yeah, only, mostly happen. I'll, I'll give him this much credit. Transcendent things mostly happen 
uh, by accident. Uh, super realism is impressive. Okay? It is impressive. I'm impressed. And there's tons of it on the internet. Super realistic artwork is ubiquitous. It's sort of like pornography on the internet. <laughs> Boy, there's a dangerous comparison. But it is. It, it's, it's everywhere. And I hope people are getting immune to it because it's so ubiquitous. Um, and it's, it's very impressive. Super realism is very impressive. But that's all it is. It, is, it doesn't take your soul somewhere. I mean, now I'm getting really spooky, I know. But it doesn't take your soul somewhere. It just takes your brain like, golly, that's amazing. Look, I took 400 hours. Took 600 hours to draw that thing. <laughs> And it's impressive, and I'm impressed just like you are. I go, man, that's amazing. And everybody should do it at least once. Get it out of your system. Do something, super realism. But then you should get over it because I think the mistakes is where the beauty happens. The greatest, the best part of art is the mistakes, happy little accidents. Okay, I've got a dirty. Hey, Edward, thank you, man. Man, I love your country. I hope to get to Ireland. My wife and I were hoping to get there a couple years ago, and too many things got in the way, but it's, it's at the top of my bucket list, man. I have Irish roots way back there somewhere, and uh, I'm envious of you living in Ireland. <laughs> of course, I can't complain. North Carolina is really quite nice as well. Okay, little break this time, and I'll be back in just a few minutes with the next layer. Thanks, you guys, so much for watching. All right, welcome back. That didn't take very long, did it? Now, this layer right here, I am going to do two things. One is I want the color, the sunlight that's hitting the front of this Statue of Liberty to be a warm light, not a cool light. So I'm going to hit a whole bunch of it with a warm yellow. Warm yellow, by the way, is very different from a cool yellow. Cool yellow, like cad yellow light or or um, lemon yellow or Hansa yellow. All of those are cool yellows. And frankly, if you're a student, if you're a beginner, you should think of all of those, those colors that I just mentioned. Let me say them again. Hansa yellow, lemon yellow, or cadmium yellow light. You should conceive of those in your mind. You should think of all those as greens, not yellows. Okay, but I, I'm not, that's as much as I'm gonna say about that. Trust me, I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> Never trust anybody who says, trust me, I'm right. <laughs> um, so a warm yellow, though, has a lot of orange in it, and that's what I just put on there. Now, I'm going to paint some sky here. <laughs> I, again, I always get... <laughs> You got, if some of you are watching me for the first time, maybe you're, you just are, are gasping at some of this, aren't you? Um, I love painting on the street. I love making people gasp because <laughs> it's not what they expected. Um, most of you, I told you I was going to do blue sky, and you sort of thought, you sort of, without thinking about it, you thought, well, he's probably kind of going to stay in the lines. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Surprise on you. Uh in a way, you could, you could call all of my painting as a primer, primer, primer. <laughs> I'm not sure. It depends where you live, how that word's supposed to be pronounced. It's a primer on how to paint loose. Okay, so if you're, if you're one of, like most of us who say, man, I wish I could paint loose. Well, watch me, man. <laughs> we, we be painting loose here. <laughs> we be painting loose. Okay, now I'm going to do something right now that I hadn't really anticipated. I've got a damp rag, and I'm gonna lift out some of that real strong blue that I just taught, partly simply for this reason, that I want some of that early, that first stuff, that first orange stuff that I put down, I want some of that to show. And all of my, that blue was covering up too much. So it's sort of undoing a lot of what I just did. And, and, and by the way, are you noticing the manner in which I am moving is very important. I see, see the strokes of energy that are going through the painting that I, that I just created? One more. Boom! That, that would not be the same if I went, let me back out so you can see me a little bit, that would not be the same if I did some tongue painting, or in this case, tongue ragging. What do I mean by that? 
You got it? So if I went like this, I'm not going to do it. I would make an ugly mark. But instead, I go like this, and I make a beautiful mark. It cannot be done slowly. The, en the energy of the stroke is, is critical in how the stroke looks. Wow. Fun. Fun, fun, fun. Okay, I'm not going to take a break. I'm going to keep right on going. Normally, at this point, I would let this dry, but two things. One, it's quite thin, so it's, I don't have to wait too much. Uh, and the other is, it's okay with me right now, this time, it's okay with me if um, my white paint, because that's what I'm going to do next, if my white paint picks up a little bit of that um, blue or yellow. So this is my second layer of white. I think you know this already, but let me spell it out again. Every time, so this is like the fourth time, perhaps, that I've painted, in this case, the Statue of Liberty's face. And each time, I try, I'm trying to get a little bit more accurate to rectify or correct the errors that I made the time before. Does that make sense? Now, what most students do, I want to be gentle here, but I, I want to instruct you. Most students are really hung up about drawing. They're nervous and unconfident, inconfident. <laughs> they lack confidence in their ability to render to draw a thing realistically with similitude. Does that, make sense? Does that make sense? Most students are, right? I've been there, done that, right? So because of that insecurity, they do what I call, they rush to judgment. <laughs> they, they, they try to hurry up and get the drawing uh, accurate because once they get the drawing accurate, then they can relax a little bit and enjoy, if you will, the painting process. And I contend that that rush to judgment is actually very counterproductive. Um, instead of trying to hurry up and get your painting realistic or accurate, just allow the image, the accuracy, if you will, to emerge out of the mist slowly, little by little by little. Don't try to do it all at once. Let it, let it appear slowly. And the mistakes that you make in the earlier stages are quite important in the final um, look of the painting. Now, by the way, that little that little spike right there—I just it, it, that's the third location. <laughs> it's the second or third time I've moved it. Again, each time trying to make corrections and be a little more accurate than I was the time before that. Now, I'm going to do something else here. Where, here we go. <laughs> this brush is damp, um, but it doesn't have paint on it. Okay, that didn't have as much effect, effect as I wanted, but that's all right. It's just got a little bit of streakiness in there that is pleasant. The temptation for all of us, I think, th those of us who are painting real painting, and I, I, I'll go back, I, I, for the last several months, I've been naming Franz Halls as, I, it'd be more accurate to say Rembrandt, but he's so, he's so over the top, good and famous, that I pick somebody just slightly less known, Franz Halls, the father of good painting. <laughs> um, When you paint r real painting, the mistakes in the earlier layers are actually advantageous, beneficial, and good. The, mo the, the breakable law of painting statement goes like this. The best painting happens while you're trying hard to do something else. 
So if that's true, then you sh it behooves all of us to just do something else, which is exactly what my painting technique is a reflection of. Okay, uh, I'm going to take I'm going to take a quick break here because I do need this white to dry. Then I'm going to come back with some dark details. Now hang on, hang on, hang on. No, changing my mind. Um, I'll do the dark in oil. I'm going to go to oil here in a little bit. Franz Halls. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the confirmation, Edward. Appreciate it. Okay, I'll be back in just a few minutes, guys. Appreciate you watching. Welcome back. So I'm proceeding now with the oil glaze. And uh, I'm debating very much what colors to do. Now, you understand, because this is acrylic and everything is dry, <clears throat> I can do literally anything I want on top of this um, painting and wipe it off as if I so choose. So there's a real strong, real safe safety net built into this system. So I can try crazy things like pink, <laughs> like, like a permanent rose. How would that look? And of course, I'm 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 trying to be a little bit daring in this painting. I will put it this way: the more conventional a subject matter is, the more freedom you have, and I think you the more freedom you better take to do something unusual with it. So. Since the Statue of Liberty is one of the most recognizable cliches, it would be safe to say, in America, it behooves me to, to do, think about doing something creative with it. <laughs> and so I did a, the first glaze I started was um, Permanent Rose. Then I did some oxide red, which is, of course is a brown, and now I'm doing some phthalo blue up here. You can do any colors you want, any number of colors you want when you're doing the, the glazes. By no means limited to any number or combination of colors. Okay, that's kind of fun. Let me, I'm going to push it, I want to do some violet here. Do a little bit of a vignette in the corner. Let me zoom in for you here. A little bit of violet down here as well. And again, using my approach to painting is try to create enough chaos in the underpainting stage so that you have plenty to react to. You have lots to respond to in the later stages. That's a sort of a summary of my painting technique. Create a lot of surprise. <laughs> okay, I think that'll do. I'm gonna put those brushes down and clean them up later. I'm gonna pick up a rag right now. And uh, let me turn it into two rags so I can have one in each hand. And let's just do a little bit of highlights here. Okay, I think that'll do. Now, next step is do some fairly serious drawing. Now, at this point, I go back and forth between drawing with brushes and drawing with pencils. Today, I don't know why, but I just feel inclined 
to draw with brushes. So I want to mix up um, ultramarine and violet and a little bit of brown oxide red so it's not too 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 bright but I want it I want it I don't want it to kill too much color okay now let's let's do some some of the dark areas one of the things that concerns me the most is that when I look at this with fresh eyes um, I don't have the angle of the face quite right my face is leaning a little bit too much and it it seems to me it should be a little bit more upright so once again uh, I'm not upset about my earlier mistakes if you will they all serve to make the final product more interesting now I do want to be realistic though I hear it in the when I'm done so this is probably the sixth time that I've drawn the the face depending you know what you call drawing so I have lots of opportunity to change my mind that's in my mind very very important so I give myself lots of opportunity to make corrections I think that's, I think that's fairly accurate. I had too much her hair was sticking up too high here again so even though I've drawn it this many times I'm still making significant corrections and again I'm not terribly upset about the, the mistakes quote-unquote that I'm leaving behind they all serve to make the final painting more interesting now, of course in the final stage of course I am I am going to uh, cover up things with some opaque paint I'm free to cover up anything that I don't feel like you know serves the final product that almost always includes a little bit of quote-unquote correcting you know covering up but you, you don't you do just do that in the last stage not not leading up to it Because until you get to the last stage, you don't know which of your mistakes are going to actually look good. <laughs> so you make that decision on the very last layer, which is the opaque layer. Until then, some of the things, you, you might cover up things that, act, that are actually going to make your painting a better painting. So I'm making some pretty big corrections here. I'd rather not do that. I'd rather be a little bit more accurate than this in the early stages. But I'm not, and uh, so that's all right. It'll all the little changes that I make, as I said, will make the final product just a little bit more interesting. Now, very often um, in the acrylic stage, before I leave the acrylic phase, I will, I will try to get my dark, some some of my darkest darks in place. I did not do that this time. I went, I went to oil a little early, and uh, so now I need to make sure. I really need to make sure that I am 
getting my darks darkened in, shall we say. <laughs> Make sure I'm getting my darks dark. And of course, uh, you anytime you're, you're making your painting, some part of your painting darker, you use transparent colors, not opaque. So it's very important that, that the colors I'm using right now, it's, and I make them transparent by adding medium. What medium, you ask? Okay, just in case. For those of you who are new to, to the business of Dan Nelson painting, Liquin is the medium that I usually use in to thin my oils. People sometimes say, so what, what are these transparent colors you talk about? No, 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 I don't buy transparent colors. I make them transparent by adding sufficient amounts of medium. Now, again, for those of you, anybody trying to do my technique, most traditional <sighs> painting students, <laughs> misunderstand, I, in my opinion, misunderstand um, mediums. Uh, and of course, in the olden days, in oil painting, the medium was um, li was linseed oil. And, uh, and most painters used linseed oil sort of, if I can use a cooking analogy, the way a cook uses salt and pepper in their stew or spices in their stew, they just add a little bit. That's how most people, and, and again, in the old traditional days, that's how most painters treated their, their mediums. So when, if you're trying to paint the way I paint, I, you have to go through quite the re-education process because, uh, the way I paint is the medium is the stew, the salt and pepper are, is the color, is the paint. In other words, I'm like right now I'm painting with, uh, you know, 60%, 70, 80% medium and 15 or 20% paint, maybe even 80, 20. So it, it, no, you don't just add a little bit of this. You don't add just a tiny bit of this to your paint. No, 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 no. I'm painting with huge amounts of liquid, tiny amounts of paint. That's the right ratio. And um, many students have a hard time making that adjustment because it's so counter to, especially if anybody has some traditional painting in their background. Because traditional painters painted with paint and, and just used tiny bits of linseed oil. It also relates to the, the question of fat over lean. Fat over lean, very unfortunate, um, very unfortunate phrase in the painting world because the issue is not fat over lean. The issue is uh, slow dry over fast dry. The only reason fat over lean ever got off the ground as an expression was because the fat that they were talking about was linseed oil. So it's not fat over lean. It's slow over fast. You want your underpainting to dry fast and your upper layers to dry slowly. Very, very important distinction. I get asked that not infrequently. So if you ask me that, I know you didn't watch this video. <laughs> Quite all right. <laughs> you have permission. You have my permission to not watch this video. <laughs> I'm sure that's a great relief to you. A little bit of local color now. I'm coming in with some Viridian green on these dirty brushes. Let's get some, let's get some green going on this green lady now. Just a little hint of green. Viridian, I love that transparent viridian green. is a beautiful color. 
emerald-like, in my opinion, not being terribly familiar with what real emeralds actually look like. <laughs> All I've got to go by is, you know, what I've seen in pictures. Although here's a funny bit of trivia. Anybody, especially for those of you from North Carolina, did you know that North Carolina is one of the major s sources of emeralds in the world? We have a town in North Carolina called a Hiddenite. Hiddenite, H-I-D-D-E-N-I-T-E, -E. and Hiddenite is one of is like the chemical name for emeralds or something like that. So anyway, who'd have, who'd have thunk it? They sound so exotic. I think that they would come from, you know. In my case, our home state, our hometown, our home state. All right, I like the way that's looking right now. I like the adding this little bit of green. I'm going to do some more of that. Okay, so let me tell you where I'm going from here. Next is I have the option of doing some drawing in pencil. And I think that's an option I'm going to I'm going to exercise this time. It's not so much a matter of drawing, it's a matter of how much of that pencil like texture do I want? Do I want some more? And the answer is at this point I feel like yes I do. So I'm gonna do some uh, pencil. Then I'm going to do a f my fuzz layer. Not sure that I'll get to all this today. To anything I don't get to today will be will be Daily Art Adventure number 284 tomorrow. Depending on how late I work tonight. You can see the window behind me. It is quite dark outside. <laughs> I'm crazy. I really like the time of year where the, the sun goes down early. Makes me feel a little Scrooge-ish. <laughs> don't, I, I, don't worry, I like the other end of this. I, other like, I like it the, the summer where the sun stays up till 10 o'clock, too. But anyway, I like the dramatic extremes. Okay, now... I guess I'll keep rolling here. I'll just go right to pencil. And if I get tired of you guys watching me, I'll turn you off. <laughs> Fair enough. What was that, you ask? Well, normally I do that kind of thing with brushes, but I, I certainly do it with pencils as well. It's uh. I, I put it this way almost all the time. Let me see. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Ah, this brown pencil just doesn't make a dark enough mark. Sorry about that. Um, I give my hands permission to have little seizures without my permission is the way that I put it. If I find that I'm, I've been a little too fastidious for a while, then my, my hand has permission to just to go crazy on its own. Again, so the, 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 the lines here certainly do act like a drawing. That is to say, they aid in realism or similitude. They, they, they have the, that drawing quality about them. And I, of course, I'm trying to put l the lines in the right spot. But way more important than the drawing is the texture, is the abstract, scratchy, liney quality that they add to the painting. And many of you, if you follow me for a while, you've heard me say this before. I started this rather crazy, unconventional pencil thing about two, two and a half years ago. 
uh, when I did a whole bunch of abstract paintings in the summer of, I think it was 2015, maybe 2016, I don't remember now. Anyway, I did 225 abstract paintings, completely non-objective paint, which was great fun. I still enjoy abstract painting occasionally. Um, uh, but I used these pencils in, in my abstract work and found myself enjoying the, the look, the feel so much that I said, well, maybe I should incorporate it in my regular work. So I did, and I found that I've enjoyed it ever since. I reserve myself the right to quit anytime I, <laughs> anytime I s cease uh, liking the effect. A few rivets, just hint, the hint of rivets. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure how much of this you can even see. Of course, I will post the final painting on YouTube. I, we have the ability to do that now. That's kind of a new thing. So you'll be able to see the, the finished painting in a better light than you're seeing it right now. Then you'll see these pencil marks. All right, next is the fuzz layer. I think I'm going to pause there, take a little break. Um, I think I'll be back tonight doing the fuzz layer. So it's fuzz and then pencil if I so choose after that, but probably not. Fuzz and then final layer, light opaque highlights. Thanks again, you guys, for watching. Welcome back. I realized I was really getting tired. All I had to do was sit on a stool, <laughs> ready to ready to paint more. Thank you, Colby. Appreciate it. I am kind of happy with the, the look of it. Um, for the first time, I like to point this out, and many times in my paintings, there is no white, titanium white, zinc white, traditional white paint on the canvas at this point. Um, there is white acrylic showing through underneath, of course, but what I'm trying to point out is, again, for you traditional oil painters, white is the color we use more of than anything else. And this painting is almost finished and has no traditional use of white paint, white mixed with other stuff. Okay, I'm, I'm probably uh, having to use too many words. So let me move on. The next step now in my painting process is this, what I call the fuzz layer. <laughs> uh, could also call it the translucent layer, could call it the glow layer. So the characteristic of this layer is, first of all, everything is translucent. I'm not, well, I cheat sometimes and get opaque, but opaque-ish. But basically, I'm avoiding uh, hard edges and avoiding opaque. I want everything, okay, let me get started. And the first thing I'm going to do is mix up some sky blue and get just a little bit of realistic blue sky showing through here and there. Now, I want somebody out there to yell at me, <laughs> if need be, because this right here, this is one of the layers that it is so easy for me to overdo it, to just get carried away. Uh, it's so much fun. It's just easy to do too much of it. So if I start doing too much, somebody yell. I don't know exactly how you're going to do that on YouTube chat, but <laughs> you could put up a comment and maybe I'll see it. Maybe, of course. Okay. Now, I like to point out that, <laughs> do you see what I mean by soft edges? <laughs> do, do, you, do you get the feeling that I'm not painting in the lines, quote unquote? I, I hope you feel that way because that is certainly accurate. I am not painting in the lines. And I must tell you that doing this with two hands, staying, not painting in the lines, is much easier than if I was doing it with one hand. If I were painting with one hand, I'd have to be working really hard to go outside the lines. But when you paint with, why? Because your mind, your brain can keep up with what one hand is doing. Your brain can't keep up with what two hands are doing. So um, that's sort of like a built-in safeguard 
for keeping this layer loose. Okay, then you ask the question, why? What, what's so big about, what's so great about loose? Um, well, one answer, not the only answer, but one answer to that question. I need a little blending brush here. One of the answers is that one of the breakable laws of painting is this. Are you ready? Here's one of the breakable laws of painting. And what I, with the, the characteristic of breakable laws is that they're universal. They apply to everybody, all human beings. It's not an acquired taste. This is how human beings, in my opinion, how they, we like to say, okay, here's the law, breakable law, which means you can break it, but you got to know it. Okay, it is. We like to see little bits of the background spill over into the object and little bits of the object spilled into the background. So in this case, it's real obvious. The statue is the object, the sky is the background. So what I've just said, in this case, we like to see bits of the sky spill over into the Statue of Liberty. And we like to see, later on, we like to see little bits of the Statue of Liberty spill out into the sky. Now, I could go on and on and on as to why that is the case. Frankly, I don't know the entire answer why that is the case. I just know that it is the case. The illustration I... I usually give when I'm describing this is we like to see you're painting a red barn in front of a blue sky we like to see little bits of the red barn have escaped out into the blue sky and little bits of the blue sky have escaped into the red barn okay in this case of course here today there's no red barn it's green Statue of Liberty and blue sky so I'm doing blue right now and it's very soft edges partly because of that rule I know that we all get a kick out of seeing bits of this of the blue spill over into the statue there are other reasons as well but they're too hard to describe over the video so i'm gonna for now i don't have the energy i'm just gonna leave it at that i'm gonna say trust me <laughs> don't you hate it when people say that that usually means they don't have a good explanation for what they're doing right just trust me Okay, and once again, um, this is not my last layer. Uh, the last layer is coming back and doing opaque bits of paint. This layer right here is very much intended to be translucent. I think I'm done with the blue. Yep, done with the blue glow. Now, I think I can just wipe these brushes off. Let's. I want to do some green close. Big surprise. <laughs> The two colors in, and, and by the way, can you see the photograph that I'm working from up there? I know it's probably getting blasted out by the light, but that's the photograph. And over here is my sketch that I'm working from. Whoop, 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 overshot the mark, sorry. There it is. There's the sketch that I'm working from. Oh, get my head out of the way. <laughs> there, you can hardly see it. Sorry about that. Um... Okay, back to the painting. By the way, her face looks really funny. In, in my viewfinder, if it looks anything like that to you guys, you're probably thinking, boy, she looks really homely right now. Trust me, it doesn't look that bad in real life, but it does look kind of bad there. I hope it doesn't. Anyway, never mind. Don't judge till, it's, till I'm done. Okay, let's do some fuzzy green. Now, mixing titanium white with viridian green or something i don't know if that's what it is exactly but it's a viridian like green that's all i know for sure and where do i want to put this so it needs to be a little bit lighter again this is not my last layer this is second to last so we're talking fuzzy edges translucent that means you can see through it it's fuzzy but you can see through it Okay, I trust that you understand what those what the word translucent means. It's, people do get confused often though between they say translucent when they mean transparent and vice versa. So I'm not I'm not gonna insult your intelligence, but you just go look it up if you're not sure. Don't tell anybody that you're confused. <laughs> Keep it between you and yourself. <laughs> <sighs> Again, this is the glow layer, I call it. It's another good name for this layer. 
and painting the fuzzy glow on stuff. Where else do I need? Oh, right here. Definitely need some glow, green, green glow happening here. And as I said, some of the green spills out into the blue sky. Okay, here's part of the reason. Why is, why does that law exist? Why do we like to see little bits? And the Part of the answer, another answer, is because that's the way our eyes actually see the world. Um, things in our peripheral vision, um, I'll say, pixelate and, and transpose, trade places with each other. And if you paint that way, it, give, it, it feels more like natural vision, more than uh, super realism, by the way. Super real, realistic painting is very artificial. I could talk about that for a long time and I won't. I'm just going to resist the temptation right at the moment. Just want to give a general green tint, slight green tint to some of this. Don't like what just happened right there, so we'll lift it off. Okay, I'm just about done here, I believe, with the fuzz layer. One of the ways you know you've got a painting method that, that suits you is you look forward to each next layer. Like right now, I'm looking forward very much to the last layer. Like, oh man, that's gonna be great. I can't wait to get started. That's a good, that's a good place to be. Good paintings are the result of good process. And good process is not stick your tongue out and just start rendering the heck out of the, the thing. Okay, I'm good. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to take a real short break here and come back for the very last layer in just a few minutes. Of course, in, unless I decide to do more, <laughs> I always have the right. In fact, I have a sense because of this subject matter that I'm actually going to paint on this tomorrow, um, doing glaze over the whole thing and going from there. Okay, enough said. I'll be Welcome back. I am down to the, I think, the last phase, the last stage. Thank you, Colby. Down to the last stage. Now, the last phase, there are four, always, I, I say this all, four different places to start. One is with the lightest, brightest, whitest thing, which in this case would be the white on her forehead. Let me show you again my photograph up there, just barely off, off your view there. Uh, the lightest place would be on her arm, forehead, and part of her cheek, and so forth, um, if I choose to keep those characteristic whites. Uh, that lightest place is one option. Focal point is another option. The furthest away object, sky, is a third option, or some local color. And in this case, I have felt like, as I'm sitting here, that it is, in fact, option number four today that I feel compelled to do, and that is I really want to nail down some of this uh, local color. It's the, um, of course, the, the green copper. What's the name of Viridian? What's the name of the green copper? Oh, good grief. I know that word. Um, it's the, the greenness in the, in the shadows that, well, secondary reflection is a better word for it that I really feel like I want to nail down before I can proceed with the rest of this painting. So I'm going to do some of that first. That is to say, now, and I, I call this layer the opaque highlights, but I'm 
cheating, playing with the words a little bit because many times this layer is in fact not opaque but also translucent like what I'm doing right here under her chin. There might be a tiny bit of opaque right there, but most of what I'm we're creating here is actually quite translucent. So I call it opaque, but it isn't always so. And for some reason, I just felt like I needed to nail this color, this secondary reflection um, down. And again, I'm, <laughs> when I paint sometimes, I forget words. It's so funny. So evidently, I really I'm operating out of the some side of my brain, the brain that the side of my brain that can't remember words. So I use this the the term for copper when it turns green, the name of that color. Somebody can tell me here in a minute. We'll get it figured out. So I'm looking at the photograph quite a bit and the places where this particular color shows up, it, it actually is in secondary reflections. It's not, it's not where the light is hitting the uh, statue and it's not the shadow. It's the secondary, it's where light is bouncing off some other part of, this, of the Statue of Liberty and hitting the underside, the shady side of um, the statue. That's almost all of it, maybe a little bit up here. Again. The question in my world is not when the painting is done. The question is, when is each stage, each phase of the painting done? That is the question. And it's easy to do too much at every point. Okay, but before I leave, okay, so I'm going to consider that first layer done. But before I leave this color, while well, I've still got this on my brushes, I'm going to follow my, my own advice, which is, See, I, I basically put the same color green over much of the painting. That's, a, that's an early hint that you've probably done too much or that you need to come back and do a slightly lighter shade of that color um, on top of the color you just put down. Does that make sense? It's almost always a good idea. And there are not that many things in oil painting, in painting that you can say are almost always a good idea. But this is one of them. Almost always a good idea to come back with a slightly lighter color on top of what you just did. This is in the opaque realm when you're dealing with the opaque stage of the painting process, which I'm finally down to. I consider everything I've done up until this point, I consider all of it to be underpainting. This is the only stage that I call <laughs> overpainting, for want of a better word. Um, and I, it only covers up about 15% of the canvas, but it is also the slowest, most meticulous phase of the painting process. So it's the fussiest, the slowest, but only covers about 15% of the finished canvas. And I'm about to leave it here. So I'm doing a slightly lighter version of the green that I just did a few minutes ago. This is not the lightest green by any means. Uh, her face that I'm going to do in a little while is almost white. But we're working our way up toward that light color. Okay, I'm going to stop right there because I want to make a very important change shift. 
I'm going to start doing blue sky now because I feel like I, I don't know how much of this green that I'm going to do until I get some of the sky down. So in a sense, I'm answering the question different than I did a few minutes ago. A few minutes ago, I said, where, do I, where am I going to start this last layer? And my answer at that moment was with that local secondary green. Now I'm coming back and on purpose saying, okay, now let's change gears. What I want to do now is blue sky. As you can probably, because there's a lot of blue sky in this view, in this scene, right? I am not going to paint, <laughs> as you probably guess, I am most certainly not going to paint all of that blue. Only a little bit where it really needs it. Hey, BJ, welcome back. I've been gone for a while, too, so you didn't miss too many hours of painting. I, w I would like, I w I, again, if you're a student painter, anybody, and you're watching, I, I would like you to be paying attention to the way I am applying the paint, especially something as, what, mundane and common as blue sky. Please notice that I am not going brushy, brushy, brushy. Please notice, uh, I am trying to be a good instructor here, that in fact I'm leaving little bits uh, peeking through, un un uncovered. Yeah, do notice those things. And the further I get away from the focal point, which in this case, of course, is her face, the further I get out from the focal point, the less I'm going to paint. The less of everything I'm going to paint, including the less blue sky I'm going to paint. So I'm already beginning to fade out my, my treatment of the blue sky. And getting just the right amount of energy is a, is a real trick. I'm going to pick up this brush for a moment and cheat. Now I am doing brushy brushy, right? When any time that you're intentionally obfuscating texture, I like to use that big word because I like your response to be, well, golly, I'm not sure that I ever consciously obfuscated texture. Correct. You got it. Correct. Therefore, you, you do not very often do brushy, brushy, brushy. Only when you're obfuscating. <laughs> And many of you have never consciously obfuscated in your whole life. You're going to have to go and look up what does obfuscate mean, right? Again, the point being brushy, brushy, brushy. When you need it, you need it. But most student painters, that is their default brush stroke. And it is awful, 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 awful. <laughs> Hello, greetings from the U.S. Raise mail. Good to hear you. Good to hear from you again. Welcome back. Where have you been? <laughs> uh, thank you for joining me this evening. It's evening. It's 7 o'clock where I am. I don't know where you, you all are. I'm in eastern North Carolina. Well, central North Carolina, eastern United States. I'm not sure that I want this heart. No, I don't. I want, I'm just deciding right there. I do not want, I, I don't want that edge up there to be that hard. I want it to be soft. There we go. Drawing too much attention if it's that hard. I, spoke, I talked earlier quite a bit about how your mistakes, quote unquote, which what, what could be called mistakes in the early stages, serve to make the final painting better. Let me show you one right here. Let me zoom in real tight if I can. That's as tight as I can go. 
right here. Do you see this little dark red line? It was, it was a part of a larger line, and there's another one. Both of those were erroneous drawings of this line. See, at one time I thought it was up here, and another time I thought it was here, and actually ended up here. But I've covered up most of it, but the fact that I let a little bit show through actually is a nice little detail and makes the finished painting just a little bit more interesting. That's why you don't get all grumpy, as I like to say, and, and cover up those mistakes early on. There's a time for covering, and that is now, but now that everything else is done, I can, I can put those erroneous marks in perspective and figure out how to use them and not be, I'm not all grumpy erasing them. Never, never, never erase in a painting. Erasing means you're grumpy, you're upset, you're angry, you're, you know, cussing yourself. <laughs> that's, that's, that's erase, the spirit of erasing, as I like to say, don't let the spirit of eraser come on you. <laughs> that grumpy, that grumpy thing where you're cursing yourself. No, 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 don't ever, don't ever erase. So you paint, you cover stuff up, but you don't do it with the spirit of eraser. You just do it with the spirit of, now I am painting. I hope that made some sense to somebody. Because <laughs> doggone it, it was really important. <laughs> Here I am, obfuscating again, okay? Yeah, there's a place for brushy brushy, but only uh, when you're doing it on purpose. It's a rare stroke, not a common stroke, but for most students, it is their default setting. They do brushy 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 when they don't know what else to do, and that's bad. You want to grow out of that as quickly as you can. Again, I'm going to do it again right there. That's the most brushy brushy I've done in a painting in a long time. Okay, now I'm going to follow my own advice again. I just put a whole bunch of blue everywhere. It was essentially the same color blue in a lot of areas. That means it's probably a good idea for me to come back now and do some lighter blue on top of the blue I put down earlier. Just slightly lighter. You probably can't even see the difference in shades, but here in person, it's very effective. It's a nice touch. Okay, I'm going to, all of a sudden, I feel the need to leave the blue behind. Um, let me just do a little bit over here, because I now I'm at a point where I don't feel like I know how much light blue to do until... Um, Whoa, I just about fell over, <laughs> leaning back in my tall chair. I don't know how much, won't know how much blue to do until I get some of the highlights of the face uh, blocked in, shall we say. We don't usually word, use the term blocked in for this stage, but I need to get the light areas of the face nailed down. I feel like before I know how to proceed, even with the sky. So let me clean these brushes. And let's start doing some light stuff. So I'm going to mix up a color, a light green, a little bit of yellow ochre in it, a little bit of yellow in it. Now I know that I'm going to be doing this, this color this light green highlights in several steps, several stages. So this is my darkest of my light green stages. Does that make sense? Looking at my photograph a lot, trying to find where there's where this sort of yellowish green shows up. On the statue. Whoa. 
<laughs> a little bit of brushy brushy with my finger. Never paint with your fingers. <laughs> I always say that every time I paint with my fingers. By the way, I do not, you know, I'm sorry you've heard this before if you follow me much, I do not have any cobalts or cadmium. I don't have any toxic, I don't have any manganese. I don't have any toxic um, pigments on my palette for that very reason. I, I, want to be a, I want to be free to paint with my fingers. And uh, I can't stand wearing gloves when I paint. Some people do that. So I just don't use the cads and cobalts. Um, I have a, a, a YouTube video that's a tour of my not limited palette. Yeah, I think you can Google those words, Dan Nelson, not limited palette. And I give you a tour of, so what colors do I use if I don't use um, cads and cobalts? And I answer that question in that video. Okay, just about ready to again to leave this color and go to the next brighter next brighter green. Oh, oh no, 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 this area down here I want to catch. I caught just a little bit of a Mark Carter YouTube video the other day. I've watched almost all of his stuff online. Mark Carter, C A R D-E-R, not the traditional spelling of card, Carter, C-A-R-D-E-R. Uh, very good painter, very different from me, uh, but I've gotten a lot of good information from his videos. Um, one of the things he pointed out, it's like, yeah, that's exactly right. I just, just never said it that way. Um, a lot of people think, like, let's take this woman's face, <laughs> Statue of Liberty, light here, dark here, and a lot of people erroneously think, wrongly think, that if you put the light color here and the dark and this blend the two together, it'll look right. And that is not true. Almost always at the transition, there is a third or fourth or fifth. There are many colors in there. Don't assume, and usually we, this conversation has to do with real people and flesh tones, of course. But even here on the Statue of Liberty, the same thing is, is happening. Um, it is not like dark here and light here and blended in between. It is not. Um, it is a third, again, or fourth or fifth, very many colors. And that's what you have to pay attention to as a, as a painter is all the colors. Don't assume. And again, usually we're talking. Hello, Walk, walk Michigan. Seems like I'm overworking this one. Ah. You know what? You might be right, Mark. That's always a possibility. Withhold judgment. <laughs> but, but that's always a possibility. It is. And, uh, you know, you might be right. Um, well, I'm just going to have to wait and see, aren't I? I don't think I am yet, but I'm always, always, I'm aware of that, and it's, it's very possible. You might be right. I'm not going to defend myself at all and say, no, <laughs> because I might be doing exactly what you're saying. And I did like it when it had those orange streaks. I, I'm sad that I, I've got a little bit up there, but there's a, a not as much of that initial underpainting of orange. There's not as much of that showing through as I would like. So I take it your name is not Walk Michigan, right? I take it you're from Michigan and you like to walk. Is that right? <laughs> I grew up in Michigan, too. Love Michigan. I grew up, grew up mostly near Grand Rapids, but lived also in Petoskey and Traverse City. And if you're from Michigan, you're probably, unless you live in one of those places, you're probably envious of me. <laughs> lived in Traverse City as a young teenager and Petoskey as a college student. Well, my parents lived in Petoskey when I was going to college. Loved to come home to Petoskey, summer or winter.
Yeah, from Grand Rapids. Well, I, I graduated from Calvin College. Um, I believe it's a good school. Sadly, not a good art department. Sad to say I was an art major. Good school, good people, liked it. Probably should have gone to Kendall at the time, but I'm not sure. That's another conversation, isn't it? I was up there for Art Prize uh, four and five years ago. Had a great time. Didn't win, as you probably can tell, because you haven't heard about me. Had a great time. You can go back and find my... <laughs> Her, this, this woman's face is looking very strange at the moment. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It didn't look strange till like this, this last layer I was putting on. I just missed a comment there. Sorry, buddy. Whoever put that comment there, I just missed it. Hey, can I tell you guys, my watchers, how many, just five of you at the moment, um, um, a, f a strange thing, and I, I don't know how to explain this, um, YouTube tells me that uh, 75 to 80 percent of my viewers are male, which is really uh, funny because 90 percent of my live students are female. So what's going on there? You know what? I am not crazy about that face. If I get really stressed out here, which does happen every once in a while, I'm not there yet, but I will turn you guys off and, you know, stand back and take a good, long, hard look at this and so forth. See if I can figure out what I don't like about it. But at the moment, I'd let me just finish what's going on here. And... Um, yeah, I just need to take a take a break and come back and look at it with fresh eyes. Now that means, of course, tomorrow I can come back and do clay, do all kinds of things to it. Um, Mayo here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, Walk Michigan. <laughs> you are male. Yeah, isn't that funny? I, 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 I mean, I'm fine with that. I'm totally fine with most of my audience being male. It's just a puzzle to me. I mean, what, do I scare off women or do I attract men? <laughs> I'm not sure which, which way to go with that. I'm not going to worry about it, believe me. I just think it's funny. This is the first time I've mentioned it. It's been that way for months and months and years. More male than female. I exude some kind of uh, uh, who knows what. I, don't even, I won't even finish that sentence. Well, Mr. Walk Michigan, you've got me a little concerned about myself here now. No problem, not your fault, I'm not blaming you. I'm going, yeah, maybe. Uh, I would say the most, common, the most common complaint I have about my paintings, uh, and I'm, I'm, the only way to get out of it is to figure out how to get out of it, and I don't know how yet. The most common complaint I have for myself is, in fact, that I do too much in the later stages and too much of the underpainting does get covered up even though I keep telling myself don't don't cover up too much don't cover up too much and I do it anyway like I said I, the, in this case I'm disappointed that there's a, more of that that initial splash most of you haven't didn't even see it you can go back and watch it later that initial splash of red orange that I put on the on the canvas when it was Bear. I wish there was more of that still showing, so that does disappoint me. There's orange, red orange, everywhere. Oh, good. <laughs> hey, Kathy. <laughs> Glad to hear it. <laughs> one, one woman, not scared off. <laughs> Glad to hear it. I, I mean, I know many of my regulars that comment with me all the time are women. Anyway, just very funny. I don't know what how to explain that. I'm, I'm f happily far from losing sleep over it. Um, just to seem funny. 
<laughs> You're just the weirdo watching, yes. It's <laughs> uh, quite all right. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Okay, but I do say, I do feel like I'm I'm at a point where I really do need to take a break and come back and look at this with fresh eyes. I am not happy with this part of the face. Uh, I'm not going to panic. It's too early to panic. When is the time to panic? Never. Um, but I'm not terribly happy with it. Well, I'm introducing a new color now that I kind of like. I, I brought I put some yellowish green on my brush. Um, I don't even know what color it was. Probably sap green, probably. And I'm liking the little bit of that that's doing. Warming it up a little bit. But I don't think that that's not the answer. It's just one interesting thing. Okay. Hey, let me pick you up and in a second and turn you around so you can see this from a more a front on angle. Because I have a feeling I'm going to quit tonight and come back and, and tackle this tomorrow. You know what? I, it's even possible that I could uh, start over and do a, another version of it tomorrow. I'm almost to the point. Okay, hang on. Let me back out a little bit. There you go. So that gives you a little better, even though, let me try this. Mm, no, that lighting, you're still getting too much glare. Sorry about that. <laughs> now, my, now my light won't go off. Okay. <laughs> yes, uh, Kathy, that, that's exactly what I was thinking. I could, in fact, tomorrow um, introduce m more of that crazy creative color through glazing in fact that's probably what i what i would do tomorrow it'll all be dry and i love actually enjoy very much coming back on day two on a painting because this will be dry i can do anything i want to it and uh, a counter glaze is what i do most often that is to say if it's a cool painting like this is i'll do warm glazes on top of it so that's very very standard for me um At the moment, I, I, those are, I think there's some drawing issues that are bothering me. So that requires fresh eyes. So thanks, you guys, so much for watching. Leave more comments. I'll respond to you as I have time. And uh, that'll be it for today. Hope to see.